So my parents really didn't have the money to help me get through school. So I had to work while I was in school. Do you want to hear the story about how I got into politics? Yes. yes. Uh, President Obama and I went to law school together. He reached out to me and he said, would you be willing to help me? I went on to help him. Um, and of course he had that historic victory. Were you naughty as a child? Yes. How naughty? Oh my God. <laughs> Did he play pranks on people? I don't want to get into trouble with your parents. They would hook up the battery cables to the metal doorknob. That electrified the doorknob. So now they tried to get out of the bathroom. They would like banging on the door. Nobody got hurt, but it was one of the fun things we used to do. going to be interviewing Anthony Scaramucci, a world-renowned investor, and an author of many amazing books, such as How Entrepreneurs Turn Failure into Success, and What You Need to Know About Hedge Funds, But the Managers Won't Sell You. Welcome, Anthony Scaramucci. Nice to see you guys. With our other questions, we have a burning one that we just have to ask. Why are you called the Mooch? When did you get that nickname? Okay, well, so when I was a young boy, I think you told me you were 10. Okay, so let me set the scene for you. When I was eight years old, I was in a gym class or physical education at my elementary school. And we had a very tough, uh, politically incorrect phys ed teacher from Germany. And I'm just going to set the scene for you. Your parents will laugh at this. It was 1972. And he didn't like people that had four syllable last names. And so there were Polish Americans in my class. There were Italian Americans in my class. And uh, yeah, my my last name has four syllables. I don't know how any yours does, but but I'll tell you right now, he didn't like us. And so he decided that he wasn't going to call us by our last name. He was going to pick one syllable in our last name. And that's what he was going to call us. And so I have four syllables of my last name. It's Scaramooch E, Scaramucci. So he started calling me Mooch when I was eight years old. And that nickname has stuck with me for the rest of my life. Honestly, that, that's kind of funny. Can you tell us about your childhood? Why did you grow up? So I was born in New York to Italian-American immigrants. Um, my mother and father actually were born here in the United States, but my grandparents were born in Italy. And so the family was very centered around Italian culture. My parents spoke Italian in the house. Uh, my grandparents spoke Italian and we more or less lived a Italian you know, sort of from Italy type of lifestyle when I was growing up. My grandparents uh, on my mother's side lived down the block. Unfortunately, my dad's parents had already passed away before I was born. So I, I only got to know my mom's parents when I was a child. Um, and I, w I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood. So what that basically means is nobody in my neighborhood, no parent went to college. And so each parent had different jobs that were related to hard work and being in a union and getting paid by the hour as opposed to going to college. And so um, I went to the local public school, the elementary school, the junior high school, and the high school. Uh, my dad was actually a crane operator. And so uh, I grew up in a town where on Long Island, we had these very, very large sand deposits. And so if you ever learn about Long Island's geology, it is literally a remnant of the Ice Age. And so when the glacier came down, it mowed down the mountain ranges. Uh, it pushed all of that crushed aggregate into the water. And when the glacier receded, it left Long Island Block Island, uh, the elbow of what is Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So if you ever look at the map and you say, well, what are all those islands doing off of the 
northeast continent, you know, the, the North American continent, that's all remnants of the glacier. And so uh, out here on Long Island, where I lived, there was a tremendous amount of crushed sand. And so my father, who grew up in a coal mining town in northeastern Pennsylvania, he responded to an advertisement to come out to Long Island to mine sand as opposed to going into the ground and mining coal. And so my dad got here in the 50s. Um, he's 80 seven years old. He's about to turn 88. And he worked for 42 years as a crane operator. And so uh, it was a interesting way to grow up because there were no books in the house. There was no, uh, uh, I mean, they spoke mostly Italian. So, it, and it was an Italian dialect. So it wasn't even like Italian, like you would learn in school, but it was sort of like a course Italian. And, uh, you know, they were great people, thank God, and they were loving people, but they didn't have education. So I had to find my way into the different schools that I ended up going to. Uh, it was sort of like uh, uh, finding your way around in the dark because I didn't really have any family members that had done anything like what I'm currently doing. What were some of your favorite subjects in school? Who guided you? Well, yeah, well, I was definitely into sports as a kid, and I still try to be into sports today. I think you always have to try to stay physically active, guys, but I think you know that. And so, uh, and you got to eat right. You know that, right? So I'm sure your mom and dad are telling you that because this way, <laughs> if you eat too much sugar, sugar tastes great, but you get very grumpy when you eat sugar. So. They're both v nodding very vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so so for me, my favorite, other than, you know, sports, um, my favorite subjects were really in history and in English and in writing. Um, I enjoyed that probably more than anything else. Um, lucky for me, I was actually very good in math. And so I had very high test scores, thank God. Not bragging about that, but I just had a good knack for school. And so I had good test scores in English and in math. And so surprisingly, because I never took an SAT preparatory course or anything like that, I had very high SAT scores, which are sort of a preparation course or a test that you have to take to help a college admissions office analyze your uh, ability to do the work in college. If you were interested in mostly like the arts and literature, why did you uh, choose to get a career in like politics and economics? Okay, so that's a really good question. So I left school with a lot of school debt because my parents couldn't afford the college or the law school that I went to. Um, not that they weren't trying to help me, they were, but they just did, were not making enough money. You know, my dad, when he retired, his top salary was about 35,000 US dollars uh, the year that he retired. And so the schools that I went to were like 24,000. I mean, this is going back 30 plus years ago. So my parents really didn't have the money to help me get through school. So I had to work while I was in school. I had several jobs. Uh, and of course, I worked all summer to save up money to go to school. But when I left law school and my undergraduate school, I probably had $150,000 worth of school debt. And so I made a decision to go to Wall Street primarily because it was going to pay me a lot of money. Um, it wasn't, uh, I didn't sit there and say, okay, what is the thing that I love? I'm, I'm going to go do the thing that I love. I said, okay, what is the thing I'm going to do that will make me money? And so what I did was I wrote down in my diary, I said that the day that I pay off my school debt, I will leave and start my own business because I always wanted to have my own business. And so I wrote that down in my diary. And so I went to work for a, a very large company called Goldman Sachs. And it uh, has an office in Singapore. It has offices around the world. Uh, the great company. Uh, and they trained me and I worked there for pretty long period of time, seven years. And I paid off my school debt in May of 1996. And so I went to my boss and said, listen, I want to leave and start my own company and I would like your help. And they didn't want me to leave, uh, but I decided to leave anyway. 
Um, and, but I, I left on very good terms with them and they helped me get my business started. And so I started my business. I, I paid off my school debt in May. And then I did something I really always dreamed about, which was to own my own business. Do you want to hear the story about how I got into politics? Yes. yes. Okay. So I had no network. And so what happens is when you graduate from school, you're trying to get your career started and you're trying to meet people that can help you with your career. And so I didn't really know that many people. And since my parents never went to college, they didn't really know that many people that could help me with my career. And so my job at Goldman Sachs was to be in the asset management area, to meet very wealthy people, to convince very wealthy people to use the services of Goldman Sachs, you know, our ability to manage money or our ability to provide them with investment advice. But I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any wealthy people. And so I went into politics because I knew there would be an opportunity to meet people who were very successful. And so when I was 25 years old, I wrote my first political donation to a man named uh, Rudolph Giuliani. Now, you may have heard of his name or not, but I bet your parents know who he is. He, he became the mayor of New York City in the 1990s. Uh, but in 1989, I wrote him a check. Uh, he was in the Italian American community and I wrote him a check for $250 and I became young Republicans for uh, Rudy Giuliani. He lost that election uh, and I became close friends with him uh, and I helped him in 1993 again. And when he won that election, it was very, very good for me because his network of people, he's probably almost 20 years older than me. And so his network of people uh, became very helpful to me. They helped me grow my business. And so then I worked for Governor Pataki, who was the New York State governor. And then in 2008, a friend of mine who I had gone to law school with uh, ran for president. And I think you guys know who he is. His name is uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and so uh, President Obama and I went to law school together. He reached out to me and he said, I know you're very good at political fundraising. I'm not a Republican, but we know each other. Would you be willing to help me? And since I had a good relationship with him and I wasn't, you know, that ideologically bent one way or the other, I said, sure, I went on to help him. Um, and of course, he had that historic victory where he became the first African-American in U.S. history to become the president of the United States. And so um, that's how I got involved. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I ended up working for President Trump, but I was always a moderate Republican, and I had spent time working for Governor Mitt Romney, George uh, Bush, George W. Bush, uh, Jeb Bush, his brother. Um, but I really got into politics because it was a way to help me with uh, grow my business. So what jobs did you have during school? Just so we and other kids get an idea. So I had a lot of different jobs. Um, so in school, I was delivering pizza. And so I, I, I had bought myself a, uh, a used car uh, to take me back and forth to school because I lived on Long Island, but I went to school uh, in a suburb of Boston. Uh, the school was called Tufts University. And so I lived in Medford, Massachusetts. And so I had a small car. Um, it was pretty run down, but, but it, was, it, was, it was workable. And so I delivered pizzas. Um, I, I had a uh, New York Times uh, paper route when I was in school. So I used to get up early in the morning and kids that had a, uh, a New York Times subscription, I would drop off the papers at their dorm room doors. Um, I delivered pizza at night. And then when my junior year, because uh, I had a very high LSAT score, that's sort of the, uh, the, the, the test that you take to go to law school, right? So there's an SAT for college, but then there was a thing called an LSAT. Uh, and I had a very, very high LSAT score. And so there was a company at that time by the name of Stanley Kaplan, um, and they asked me to become a teacher for them. And so I was uh, a junior in high school, I'm um, sorry, college. And so that was a really good job because they played, paid like 16 
dollars an hour, which was a lot of money back then. And so I I did that job. Um, um, I probably had three or four courses. I was teaching almost every night um, when when I uh, when I was a senior in uh, in college. Um, but my summer jobs were always in construction because of my dad's uh, life. Um, I was able to work on the stone dock in my town. Um, I used to help my dad oil the crane uh, in in the uh, summer. Um, I actually had an uncle of mine that had a motorcycle shop in town. And so I would spend the weekends working for him. I used to sell mopeds and helmets and motorcycles. And uh, it was a very famous motorcycle shop. So we had a lot of interesting people come into the motorcycle shop. You guys probably are too young to know this American singer, but there's a very famous singer out here on Long Island by the name of Billy Joel. Have you ever heard of Billy Joel? No, not really. I no. haven't. He's a very famous singer, but he's in his 70s now, but he used to come to my uncle's motorcycle shop and we became friends with him. That, that's cool. That's on... Yeah, so it's been it's been an interesting life because I've had the opportunity that America has provided because in America you don't really have a lot of that uh, stagnation of class and uh, let me see if I can explain that to you you know if it doesn't matter in America sort of where you come from uh, it's more of a merit based society and so. Uh, even though my parents never went to college and they didn't have a path for me, I had to carve my own path uh, because of the freedoms in our country and because of uh, you know a lot of helpful people, I was able to find my way into the career that I have. Did you have any favorite teachers? Why were they your favorite? Here's what I would say to you guys. I don't want you to think about this, okay? Um, my favorite teachers were the ones that really loved teaching, you know, and sometimes you get teachers that are doing it, but they're like, they don't do it with a lot of enthusiasm. So my favorite teachers are the ones that uh, I thought were the most enthusiastic. And I guess what I would say to you guys is you want to be enthusiastic. You want to be enthusiastic as a student. Okay, so this way that your teachers will say that you're my favorite student, you know, because what happens is the teachers that have enthusiasm, you end up liking. But for the students, the ones that are enthusiastic, the teachers end up liking. You see what I mean? And yeah. So you want to live your life with a lot of enthusiasm. But my favorite teachers were the ones that really like teaching. Were you naughty as a child? Yes. Okay. 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 So I don't... pushing aside everything, tell us more. How naughty? Your parents probably wouldn't want me to tell you how naughty I was as a child. So, but you have to remember, I grew up in a very tough neighborhood, and my parents were working, uh, um, and so there wasn't a lot of adult supervision. And so, and when my dad came home from work, you know, he he worked a job that was very tiring. You know, he 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 was in manual labor. And so he when he came home from work, we had to clear out and give him the opportunity to rest and to watch whatever television show that he wanted to watch. And we had to be at our, our dad's dinner table at five o'clock. Unless I played sports, if I was, you know, he came home and that plate was set by my mom. We had to sit there and we had to make sure we were there eating with him. Um, but, you know, we didn't really have a lot of adult supervision. So, yes, I was a bit of a renegade as a as a kid. Let's leave it at that. Did he play pranks on people? Yes, all the time. Yes. Do you have any funny stories of pranks he played? All right. Well, I don't want to get into trouble with your parents, but I used to work at my uncle's motorcycle shop. And if there was a customer that we didn't like, okay, uh, when when they asked us where the bathroom was, and that was one of my jobs, by the way, I had to keep the ba the bathroom clean, okay. And there's some really disgusting people that go into a motorcycle shop. And so, when somebody I didn't like asked me where the bathroom was, we had a car battery, 
Okay, and so when you start a car, you have a battery inside the car that has electricity in it, which starts the ignition. And so we used to have a charged car battery outside the bathroom door, and I would hook up the battery cables to the metal door knob. And so that electrified the doorknob. So now when the person went into the bathroom and they locked the door to use the bathroom, the doorknob was electrified. So when they tried to get out of the bathroom, they would, and they would be like banging on the door. They'd be like, what the hell's wrong with this doorknob? It's electrified. You know, I feel like I'm getting an electrical thing from the doorknob. Well, we used to do that to people when I was a kid, yeah. And then I had to, of course, take the battery cables off and let the guy out of the bathroom, but, you know. Okay. Let's... Nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt. But it was one of the fun things we used to do when we were a kid. Let me guess. The person you didn't like didn't buy anything. No, that, that was never really it. It was attitude. It was attitude. I didn't care about, you know, whether they bought something or they didn't buy something, you know. Here's something you need to always remember, okay, that we're all equal, okay? It doesn't matter how rich somebody is. It doesn't matter how poor somebody is. We are all equal. And there are some people, unfortunately, on this beautiful planet that do not believe that. They think that they are sometimes better than other people. Um, and so if you have less money than them or they think that they're more sophisticated than you, they have a tendency to sometimes look down on you. And so for me, it was never about who bought something in the store or who didn't. It was more about what their attitude was like. Were they nice? Uh, were they treating people with respect? You know, like when I go to a hotel, because my grandmother was a maid, I always leave a very large tip for the maids when I'm in a hotel room because maid could be somebody's grandmother. And that maid may have a family that they're working for to take care of. And so it was never for me about the money, you know, what I don't like is when people treat other people with disrespect. And that's basically why I had to denounce President Trump and why I had to break from President Trump and explain to people that he really wasn't the right person to be the American president, even though we helped him become the American president, which I'm sometimes sorry about. Uh, the way he handled himself as a bully, it's not the right look for the American people and it's not the right look for me being associated with somebody like that. So no, it's never really about money or buying things or who does that. It's more about how people are treated that's important to somebody like me. What do you wish you knew when you were our age, like a teen or younger? I'm going to tell you something that you should really think about. Nothing is the answer to that, okay? You should just live your lives, listen to your parents, okay? And you should enjoy your lives and not worry about anything. Because you see, when people ask me that question, I am very happy that I was a child when I was a child. I enjoyed being 10 and I enjoyed being 13. You see what I mean? And so nothing, you know what I mean? Don't take your life too seriously when you're your age. You should do very well in school and you should listen to your parents and you got to eat right and get some exercise. But, but nothing. You should just go out and enjoy your friends and 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 have a good time. Okay. Because you know, you're doing the right things. You know what I mean? And when I mean being naughty, you're being naughty like a little bit where you know you're stealing, you know, you're 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 taking extra ice cream out of the refrigerator when your mom's not looking. You know, I'm not talking about doing anything really bad. Kind of contradicting us in your parents. But I I I, my, I I have five children and I tell my children I want you to enjoy yourselves. Life is very short um, and you're nice and young and you should just go enjoy yourselves. But you should also do your schoolwork and you also recognize there's a time and place to enjoy yourself. And there's also a time and place where you have to work and you have to do the chores that are required of you. Suddenly, you know, you're just out in the blue. I think you might become our parent, uh, our parents' best favorite friend. person. Yeah. The, my mom was overjoyed by the yeah. fact that you said listen to your parents twice. Let me tell you why you should listen to your parents, though, okay? Let me tell you why, because it's hard for kids, because sometimes they don't want to listen, and they're like, oh, my mom's driving me crazy, or blah, blah, right? But, 
<laughs> but you should listen to your parents because nobody is going to love you like your parents. Nobody. Okay. Because you are part of them and they are part of you and they will do anything for you. Okay. Well, and so honestly, that should give you some level of security and that should make you feel safe. But you should listen to them because they're trying to give you really good advice about how to have a happy and have a safe, healthy life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, my parents are really good. They're this. really happy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. I mean, but that's the truth, you know, and that, I'm just telling you the truth. Yeah. What books did you like as a child? Is there a book that you would recommend for kids our age? Okay, that's a really good question, actually. So I'm trying to think of your ages. And so I loved the books by Roald Dahl, um, which were the James and the Giant Peach, yeah. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I would say to you, that at 13, there was a woman writer in the United States by the name of S.E. Hinton, H-I-N-T-O-N. And she had some really interesting books. One of them was called That Was Then, This Is Now. Another one was called The Outsiders. And these were books about uh, uh, people coming from their childhood into their teenage years and into their adulthood. And I think when I was 13, I remember reading those books uh, and thinking, boy, those were those are really good books. Uh, there's another book, I think, when by the time you get to 13, that I would recommend to everybody, which is called The Diary of Anne Frank. Oh, you know? oh, oh I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, because in school we're learning about World War II, and isn't Anne Frank the person who hid herself from the... From the yes. German people inside, like, a secret place, and then they recorded the... Oh. Her practicing religion was Judaism, so she was a Jewish Dutch girl, and her family was in hiding for two years uh, during the Nazi occupation in the Netherlands. And they were hiding. And she writes about this in a very interesting way as a very young person. I think she was only 12 or 13 years old. I don't remember her age, but I think she was probably uh, 13. And it's, it's, it's a sad book in some ways as well. Um, um, but it's also one I think worth reading at your age. If you had to describe one or two experiences during your childhood that helped to build the foundation for your future, what would those be? I had really good grades, but I did, wasn't really trying that hard. And so um, I was doing things like, how can I say it, like three quarters of the way. I wasn't, in school, I wasn't going all out uh, because I got the grades pretty easily. And so my... Uh, senior year in school, I had ended up getting accepted to college. And so I wasn't working super hard. And I had to pay the tuition bill to go to the college. And at that time, the tuition was $24,000. And I didn't have a lot of money saved. And my father came to me with a $10,000 check. And he cashed his life insurance policy. So it's a little complicated for somebody 10 or 13, but your parents would understand this. And so my dad worked in a union. And so every time they paid him, they took a small piece of his pay to pay for a life insurance policy. So in the event, God forbid, if my father died, I would have got, you know, the family would have gotten some money from the union. Okay, you know, in terms of a, pay, a payment upon his death. And so there was a cash value to that life insurance. And my dad gave up his life insurance in exchange for the cash. And he handed me the cash. It was a $10,000 check. And he said to me, you know, I don't have the money to pay for this college. And I had to make a decision. I could have gone to the state school which was very inexpensive, or I could have gone to this private school that I got into. 
but I knew that the private school, I would meet people and it would be a different experience and it would be worth the money. I really believed that. And that was probably because some of my teachers told me that. And so when he gave me that check and I realized that that was all the money that my dad had, it was a moment in my life where I realized, wow, I have to take this seriously. I don't want to let my parents down. I have to, instead of working three quarters of the way when I go to school, I got to go work 100% of the way. And I think it's a very big lesson for people, you know, work 100%. You know, you know when you're being lazy and you know when you're spending too much time on your phone or your iPad, you know when you're doing that, okay? And you know when you need not to be doing that. Okay, yeah, I know because I do the same thing. And so I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but I'm saying you know when it happens and you should try to do less of that and try to work at 100%. You know, I don't think she knows. I do. I don't, I, I, I'm just saying I don't think she knows. Okay. I think everybody your sister's age has got the same issue. Trust me, okay? She's probably... Not any worse than any of her friends, but she has to say in her head once in a while, okay, listen, I'm going to get off of the screen. I'm going to spend less time thinking about what other people think of me, and I'm going to focus on improving myself, right? Because that's what I tell my kids. I, you know, what other people think of you is none of your business. Honestly, you don't have to care about what other people think. What you should care about is what you think of yourself. And the best way to feel good about yourself is to work hard and build yourself up. And before you know it, you'll look around and say, hey, you know, I tell my kids, there's nobody better than you. You're just as good as anybody and you're better than most. And just focus on yourself. You don't have to worry about what other people think of you. We read that you thought about quitting law school, but your mother guilt tripped you into completing the course. Looking back now, are you grateful to your mom for pushing you to go down that path? I'm terrible. Oh, my God. Such bad guilt. Let me tell you something. There's nothing like Indian or Italian guilt. You have no idea what you're <laughs> capable of, okay? You have no idea what your mother's capable of. You honestly don't, okay? She... We do. No, no. Yeah, you'll see. You'll see as you get older. They get even more tricky with the guilt. You have no idea. Is that possible? Yeah. I didn't really like law school, so when I came home for Thanksgiving... I told my parents I didn't want to go, and my mother went crazy on me. And I was like, all right, forget it. But you know what? My mother was right. It was a good idea to finish law school. You know, sometimes when you're young, uh, you need somebody a little older than you that loves you to give you a good perspective. But yes, that's a true story. Did you ever doubt yourself, and how did you manage to overcome it? Yes. So, of course, even today at my age, I doubt myself. Of course, you have doubts about yourself and you have setbacks. You know, I, I was in school and I applied for the scholarship because I didn't have any money. And I, I remember that setback like it was yesterday because I came in second on the scholarship and the person that got the scholarship, obviously they, they paid for the last two years of their schooling. And I remember being so disappointed, but what sometimes happens to you when you have setbacks if you have the ability to just keep working and to keep being present and doing your best, then other good things will happen to you. And I think what happens in life is that you will doubt yourself at times, uh, and sometimes things won't go your way. But if you just stay working and you keep a positive attitude, what ends up happening, you start to believe that even if you have setbacks or things that don't work out perfectly, you know, I'd been, I was fired from my first job and then I got rehired. I got fired from the White House. Uh, that was a pretty big deal when I got fired from the White House and it was a bad turn of events for my career. But, you know, what you do is you just keep working. You know, it's never as bad as it looks. Okay. Sometimes it's never as good as it looks. Sometimes it's never as bad as it looks. And so, do you, but but to have self-doubt is a very normal thing, um, but you have to work through it. You have to say, okay, uh, uh, okay, I'm doubting myself here, but let me keep trying. Let me keep pushing. If you could press a button and change anything in the world, what would it be? 
you guys are probably at some point going to learn about evolution and you're going to learn about Darwinism and how we've evolved over billions of years and, and formed this level of consciousness as human beings where, you know, we are able to think differently than the animal kingdom on the planet, but we're part of that ecosystem, right? So we're part of the earth, just like all the other animals and all the other living creatures are part of the earth. And so what happens is we're capable as a group of people um, through our evolutionary process uh, to really create a bond with probably like 100 or 150. And so that's when you think about early villages and the early parts of our civilization, you know, if 150 people could stick together, they could survive and they could fight the natural world and help their families. But today, we need to think about billions of people. And so what happens now is sometimes we get very wasteful. We'll take that plastic water bottle and we'll maybe not recycle it or we'll do certain things from a societal perspective that is harmful. And it's not being done intentionally, but it's just being done because of the way our minds are set up. We're not capable of thinking about all the other billions of people that need to use the resources of our planet. And so if I could press one button, it's just a really, really good question. What would be that button? It would be to try to see if we could have one big leg up in our evolutionary process where we could start thinking about all of the other people that are on the planet, in addition to our family members, in addition to our close friends. Because if we st started to think like that, I think we would conserve our resources better and I think we would let the earth heal from some of the environmental things that have happened to the earth in the last 150, 200 years. That's a really, really good question. Okay. Well, I had a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Get a good night rest and make sure your homework's done, you know, and listen to your mother, okay? You know, I'm sure your mother's on the whole thing, so listen to your mom. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you letting us interview you. Thank, Thank you. you.